And Clark McGee is our next speaker. He's another long distance traveler. He's come down from Queensland. Um, maybe some of the fisher don't know, fishermen don't know Clark, but he's pretty much a hunting icon in Queensland. There's very few serious hunters in New South Wales that don't know his name, haven't been hunting with him at one time or another. He's a, uh, a guide, hunting guide, fishing guide. He's been professional deer shooter. He's done all sorts of things. So he's been very, very active in the political scene in Queensland for a long time. He's another good resource to ask about the lie of the land. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is uh, a privilege. I see it that way. I'm not saying that lightly. Uh, what I'd like to do is show you a little bit of history so you know basically where I come from, why I'm up here today to talk to you, uh, a little bit about the situation in Queensland, my home state, um, the threats that I see coming along, uh, and some of them really serious, and maybe a few ideas that we've got that we may be able to maybe put a foot in the door to get us up, you know, another rung up the ladder to probably maybe one day have something like you guys have got down here in New South Wales. So. <coughs> Did you grow up with a dream? I did. Always wanted to be a deer hunter from this high, nothing else. And that was fueled by my dad, Jim McGee, that's in the uh, Wobbity country, 1948, uh, coming out there. He was a young bloke, went up in there and 16 year old, worked with Les Morrell and uh, Kenny Del Rimple and Jim Muir and all the big names you see in the books. This was the guy that rode the boat, that caped the heads, that did the cooking, that did the scouting, found the big heads and got these old guys in there to shoot them. So that was my dad, very keen. We come from poor, really poor Scottish background, right? My grandfather and my great-grandfather were pulling cart horses out of underground coal mines by the time they were 12 year old. Right? So they were the birth of the, the union movement and the labour movement. You know? If they thought I voted anything else by labour, they'd roll over backflips in their grave. Dad went to the Northern Territory and just happened to be a pretty long, young girl there shooting buffaloes with about seven Aboriginal skinners and her old man in behind there. Anyway, rest is history. He ended up shooting about 30,000 wild buffalo in the Territory. They set up the first export abattoirs for buffalo meat in the country. Not once did they treat the buffalo as a pest. They might have been feral, they might have been introduced, but they were a resource, they were an asset. And that's the way I was brought up. The old bloke on the left hand side there, my granddad, Elvin Parrott. Um, one of the keenest red deer hunters in the Brisbane Valley. But here's this, this you know, low socioeconomic Scot with nothing. He came to Queensland and he married the son of a cattle baron, a daughter of a cattle baron. Right? So the divide between the haves and the have nots right, is something I've grown up with. If I went into a cattle property with my grandfather, I'd be in the main house. If I went in with my dad, I'd be in the workers' quarters. So when people say about getting hunting, hunting access and these bloody cockies and whatever else, I can see things from the landowner's point of view and I can see things from the recreational hunter's point of view. 16, I went out one day with my bow and I put an arrow for a hind and it's got a fawn. So I came home and I decided I was going to be a deer farmer and that's when the trouble started. National Parks and Wildlife swarmed on us. It was going to put us in jail for taking for taking introduced fauna under the Nature Conservation Act. Going to charge us, all the rest of it. Anyway, we decided to go deer farming. So next thing at 17, I was the back of a Hughes 500 helicopter, screaming around the bush, in amongst the trees. I think it was in 13 different helicopters. This is how close we had to get to them to get a net on them. Wild red deer, the class now is pests by the government up there. $2,400 was the most I got for one straight off the machine. You didn't go to landowners and say, I'm going to control your pest for you. They'd shoot you then, right? Because they were a resource. They saw that they were a dollar. There was a dollar in them. So I did see firsthand how difficult it is in Queensland to get into that stuff for the chopper, those dead plugs, and try and get a net on one. We risked our lives in this country. 
and I did see how easy it was to shoot them from the air and you realise that you could slaughter every one if you wanted to. And we found out the, the hard way too on a few different things. We ended up upside down and managed to survive. 20 odd years I was deer farming for velvet, uh, for venison and for live export. That's in Malaysia, they were setting up a 500 acre deer property in Malaysia for the Malaysian government. We took over a thousand deer in there that one year, lost one in live export. You'll see a chittle there on the right hand side and rooster deer, right? 700 odd dollars each landed in Malaysia at that time. Huge market, but now they're considered a pest. Throughout all this time I've been guiding, guiding people on, on um, red deer mainly uh, and I've always wanted to produce the best quality animals, keep the numbers down, the quality up, get some return back to landowners. We've done the same thing with rooster deer. You know, over the years we've produced some massive rooster on landowners freehold country up in Queensland. Did the same thing with chittle deer. On one property alone that I've been working on for over 20 years, I've put $400,000 in cash back in that landowner's hands. About 20 stags a year for 20 odd years, $1,000 a stag. Right? We took over 100 stags that would go in the top, top 50 of record books out of that property. They're gone. Everyone's dead on that property. Scrub bulls, same thing, clean skin bulls, right? We've turned, I don't know how many hundreds we've shot now, and we've put a thousand bucks a piece back in the landowner's hands. I've just been given another 100,000 acres to work on where the landowner said, well, we were just gonna chop or shoot them, but you'll pay us for them. I said, yep. He said, well, go and get all those rank bulls, every rank bull you want. Same with the wild pigs. We've, we've done a lot for landowners of wild pigs. I was in the Kingaroy Hotel, I had Bob Catter, James Blundell, Les Mucken, a um, couple of the other ones from the Catter Party there, and Bob was saying how great it was. He said, a mate of mine went out the other day, got a chopper, and over a couple of days they shot 1,250 pigs. He said, that's the way to get hold of these pigs, get rid of those nasty ferals. And I said, I think you're wrong, wrong Bob. And he poop, just about spat in his beer, and he looked at us and said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I would have taken 60 hunters out, they each shoot about 20 pigs each, they would have spent money getting up here with their vehicles, with their guns, with everything we talked about here today. I said, I'd have turned about $120,000 out of those pigs and about 30,000 of that would have gone back to the landowners and we would have still killed your 1,200 pigs. And literally he shut up and he said, we have to have a talk. My son there, Kurt, he's now over in British Columbia. He's about seven years into BC. Um, well-respected guide in North America, winning competitions. His best asset is his lovely wife, Esther, and now our grandson, Trapper. Good name. <laughs> Trapper Jackson. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he was riding a horse before he could walk, little Trapper. So, the following on with this. It's, it's given me the chance, and my, and my partner, Judy, to be over there, and I've been able to guide on, on caribou and moose, and we've seen the money that gener has generated over there first hand and the benefit of quality management, of, of sensible game management. You know, 50 odd thousand dollars for a stone, stone ram. Uh, incredible stuff. So the top corner up there, that was shooting whiptails for skins at three dollars a piece through the beef depression when cattle were worth a dollar to ten dollars a head. Through BTEC, I was up shooting buffalo in the Territory for pet meat when they would literally and saw $780 million in the 70s spent on BTEC to eradicate brucellosis and TB, supposedly. Seen the tar, tar management in New Zealand, and here we are with people talking about pest animals, and the New Zealanders have learnt their lesson. They, ne they nearly had them shot to extinction, and you look at the New Zealanders now, when they threatened the tar, Bang, the money came in and people rallied against their government and they, they have learnt their lesson. Same with the Wapiti in New Zealand, what a brilliant you know, um, uh, program they've got over there. Sustainable use of wild deer, is it possible? So this is in Queensland, we're saying, can we make it work? What we're trying to concentrate on is to hunt, shoot and eat more deer. Why? Well, my whole life, 
I've been around cattle, on horses and around deer. And people might say, that's a strange mix. Who's seen those cave paintings? Lascaux in southwest France. 20 to 40,000 years BC, our ancestors were drawing pictures of cattle, horses and wild deer. And if they aren't red deer running on the wall with brow, bay and tray tines and tops on them, I'll eat my hat. This is how far it goes back with all of us. And all cultures have got the game animals that is part of our DNA. So there's no problem with me to see the Queensland coat of arms have a red stag on it. We get Beattie in there with the Labor government and they say, we're going to remove this filthy pest animal off the coat of arms of Queensland, and they nearly did. Campbell Newman came back and reinstated it. He you know, caused too many troubles for them and he, they, they, they're not back in. So <clears throat> 1992, when we saw that there was a problem, we said, we've got to do something about this. So we formed the Ridge Group. And the objects of, this, of the Ridge Group was to basically research the impact deer have on the environment, develop and implement management strategies both solely and in conjunction with government departments or agencies, private organisations and individuals. So what we're saying then, the Ridge Group, research into deer genetics and environment, we want to work with everybody possible to try and come up with a solution so these deer are going to be here as a game animal to benefit the population forever. Right? Identify the genetic path promote recreational and historic economic values of deer, foster better relationships, promote hunting activity, um, opportunities. So when we formed Ridge, we needed supporters. So we're lucky enough, we had landowners, QDA, with Brian Murphy, we had six different ADA branches, even though we were totally opposed in Queensland from ADA, I hate to say. Game Council, New South Wales, Shooters and Fishers, when it was just Shooters and Fishers party, everybody that came in, we had working solely on memberships and uh, donations to get our research scientists. Because what we wanted to do was put in place a wild deer management policy for Queensland. Because we realised the government were going to have their policy and it was going to be influenced by the Greens, by animal welfare and the anti-gun people. So we wanted to have our ducks in a row to be ready to put the argument back to them. So we realised we need to have good research so we said, right, let's get some research scientists and let's get into it. Again, there's, we wanted to set something up that worked under Queensland condition based on property-based management plans. One thing I'll, I'll try and get across to people there that literally, I'd say we've tried to do our figures on it best we can with, with citizen science. I love that. I love that too. <laughs> I'm going to use it. We're trying to get our best science that we could with a very little, very, very small budget. We're seeing probably 80% of our deer, our pigs, goats, or what we see as our game animals in Queensland are on the private freehold or leasehold land of landholders. So the situation in Queensland is nearly totally, completely opposite to Victoria. Right? So if we understand that, see where we're going. So what we want to try to put in place was something that that was compliant with legislation, was safe, was happy. The landowners, we meet their expectations, we meet animal welfare expectations. So the basic principle was deer are a resource, they're not pests. This is up on um, in the Torres Strait with the Kareg people. You try and say to them that the deer are a pest up there, and literally they will spear you. Um, we look at not just economic value, historical, cultural, social, spiritual, nutritional, educational, medicinal. Right? So if people have seen some of the clips I've put up there. You see recently I had a guy out in a wheelchair that goes out with me. He's been hunting for six years and he finally shot a double four, big old Queensland double four. What that's done for that guy is worth a million dollars. Yeah, that's worth than any, better than any economic value, whatever. The spirit that it lifted in that guy was just unbelievable. So we had re research initiatives that privately funded and managed. We looked at the role of red deer, the transmission of cattle ticks on red deer in Queensland. That was back in 1999 with Dr Neil Finch and Dr um, Professor Gordon Dryden. We tried to look at wild deer population estimations. Um, <clears throat> that was ADA there, Gordon Dryden on the other side. 
uh, MP Tony Perrot on the right hand and second from the right. And we have developed techniques where we can get a very good idea, not an absolute density, but a very good estimation of deer that are in an area. A lot of this research just wasn't finished. Performance and condition of wild red deer in Queensland. Again, showed that wild deer in Queensland were nutritionally as good as any other deer in the world. We set in place a radio um, collaring capture program for red deer that we ran for about eight years before anybody else even started. We never got any funding to keep it going. We've got this sort of data sitting there where there's two different stags with the areas that they're overcrossing. Uh, that's sitting there, never been collated. There was one red hind there that was um, about eight years, seven, eight years. You'll see there all the fawns were basically where she was seen fawning the different marks of the different years. She never went out of a kilometre radius, that one hind in a whole lifetime, and she died on one corner. Again, this is stuff we tried to put together so we had a solid argument to go to government to say, don't treat them as a filthy feral pest. Dr Hall and myself, we put in place these sort of uh, charts so that we had stuff to show government. A lot of this can be seen in the Ridge video that's been up there since 2001. Uh, that's our website there. If anybody feels like it, go and have a look at one of them. That's Clark McGee's Wild Country. A lot of this stuff in clips is already there. It's nearly 20 years old. Uh, we've got more stuff going on soon. We put in place a wild deer in Queensland discussion paper to try and say this is the way we feel it is going, this is the situation. Uh, and with it, uh, with that discussion paper was a, I think it was an 80 page attachment document which has got all the historical you know, uh, paperwork from the um, departments in there. Um, investigation of historic and cultural significance of, of red deer. Uh, from uh, UQ. We've every year we've tried to run, well not every year but most years, uh, Wild Country which is my company um, and Ridge Group Hunter Education courses where we've got people into the bush because we're trying to teach people the best way to manage deer is if you shoot more and eat more. Now we've got to keep the population down instead of shooting them, leaving them on the ground or poisoning them, get people involved and like we're saying, win that middle ground. It's, highly necessary and that was, so where's that good looking young fella on the right hand side there? Hey. <laughs> Andrew Moriarty and I up in Torres Strait there with the Kareg people doing research on, on the uh, Rusa deer there which are precarious, like we've got an animal there that's unique, fantastic little animal, they could be gone at the drop of a hat. I know how many hundred chittle deer now we've shot taken measurements, taken samples from, uh, as part of research with, with um, Andrew Moriarty and team. I wonder how many submissions we put in, including the one to the Senate, the inquiry onto the uh, deer and wild pigs and wild goats. Um, that, that one there was for the AREC committee meeting in, in Parliament in Queensland, where I got, had to be grilled by the, the powers that be on what our plans were for wild deer. In 1995, at the first sustainable use conference, part of the paper that I finally got accepted there, I put these lines, and again, this is, this is grade 10 education, Buffett McGee trying to put some ideas down, getting the best knowledge I could from the best people I could, and doing graphs on these. Okay, the first line that's going straight up that would be looking at a maximum growth rate of a species such as red deer that can only have one fawn a year and it's going to lose them to different reasons and whatever. But if there's maximum growth rate like New Zealand that my dad saw when he was culling when he said he couldn't carry enough ammunition to shoot the deer that just seemed to be breeding up overnight because he saw the exponential growth. My dad, my granddad, mum saw it in the Northern Territory. He was, dad was shooting 40 buffalo or capturing 40 buffalo a day to supply the meatworks, big bulls. And he said, it just got that way that we couldn't touch them. He said the numbers just exploded underneath us. He saw that exponential growth. This line here was to depict a more reasonable, about a 10, cre 10 year doubling rate on our, say, our Queensland red deer. If you double them each year from say 1880 when there was 10 deer released and you doubled them each 10 years, it just so happens it takes about 
100 years for that 10 year doubling to get to about 20,000. And when they hit 20,000, the next 10 years takes them to 40, 80, 160, they're gone. They're gone exponential. Again, this is Buffett science. Um, this line here was to depict the capture days when we firmly believe we knocked the red deer in Queensland off their perch for about 20 years, which gave us a bit of breathing space. One of the reasons we have a lower growth rate to New Zealand or anywhere else is because of these critters. Right? And I do a lot with the, with the wild dogs, the dingoes up, up north, um, and scrub ticks, wedge-tailed eagles, and the fact that our geography means that we've got a road about every half kilometre. You can drive up every valley. You can ride a horse right through all our range. So they're more accessible. OK, so what's the problem with our deer in Queensland? Biggest problem, I experienced it really badly. Um, deer farming was kicking on really well. Uh, strong existing markets, and then everything collapsed in the middle of a bad, bad drought. We saw hundreds of new releases right across the state. It wasn't a pest issue where these deer were breeding you know, and spreading into new areas. It was literally hundreds of deer being put in the back of cattle trucks and dropped off at every place and every patch of forestry around Queensland, New South Wales and whatever. So we escalated the issue ourselves. At the last um, sustainable use conference, I'm starting to get a little bit better at the graphs. Same graph down here. There's the dip with the uh, Queensland um, when we were capturing. 2020, we can see them. They're heading that way. We've got tons of country. They can't go to the sea, but they're going down south, and we're seeing red deer and other deer going in every direction there. You see the biosecurity uh, maps and they've got their areas coloured and all that where they expect these deer to go. And some of the species, they've got the whole of the country, like Rusa deer, basically the whole of the country marked in red. They, they think they'll go to the tip of Torres Strait and right across to Western Australia, except for a little patch in the middle of the country. So we're seeing biosecurity take it seriously. They see them as a problem. We see potential. What I'd love to do is try and flatline down in here. In the middle, the difference between flatline and growth rate is a harvest, and that's industry, that's potential, that's thousands, hundreds of thousands of new hunters, that's landowners that are involved, that's quality management, is all in there if we've got the, the guts to um, grab it. Maps, that's a very basic one. We said before about the science behind it. Every pest officer I know, and I know quite a few of them in Queensland, were all sent out notes saying, do you have pest animals in your shire? Yes. Do you have deer? Yes. And then later on, the next one, what species of deer? How many? Where exactly are they? All this information's been collated. They know every new population. They've got estimations of them. They know where they are. And they've developed a way to, to do something about it. Deer are being blamed for spreading pest weeds. Chonky apples like this. They said the deer are spreading them. What a load of rubbish. Emus, I've done quite a bit of photography on emus and I see them jumping up and taking seeds off 10 feet off the ground, emus, and you follow behind them and here's this lovely emu pat with all chonky apple seeds in it. They're the best spreaders of the lot. Fruit birds, they don't want to listen to any of this, the government. It's just the deer that are causing the problem. So righto, we've had, a, we've had a good go at trying to manage them over the years. I'll flick through these quickly because I know time's valuable here today. Um, things have all changed. We don't have a lot of options, we've got a few, but it seems like the option is to waste them or to utilise them. I'm sick of wasting them. I'm sick of it. You know, probably we pulled that year, we pulled over a thousand skins off chittle deer. Couldn't eat with the meat, just left it lie. 40 degree temperatures. You know? I hate it. One initiative we've had, and a lot of the people in the, in the room are, um, uh, we'll know this well, is the Wild Country Ridge Group balloted hunting system where we take people, get them out there onto um, private country in Queensland to hunt for red deer. Right? So this has been going now for 24 years. Basic principle behind it, we harvest, allow hunters to harvest the older mature stags. We protect the best young genetic stags, let them do the breeding. 
provide an opportunity for everybody that wants to hunt to hunt, and very, very few people that go on the ballot get knocked back. You've got to be one of the worst known poachers around to lose your application. Um, remove the lower quality genetic breeder stags. And the way we've looked at this is we based on what worked on our deer farms to say if it's working on the deer farms with genetics, it'll work in the bush. Build teamwork, ethics and discipline. Robert Borsak's gone. I was going to talk to him about discipline. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Brian Boyle on the side there. Um, yeah. Talk about difference between damage and genetics. A lot of people there, you know, they'll see a stag with two points either side and they say, oh, he's a two-year-old. He's got three points either side. He's a three-year-old. This sort of stuff. And they're letting stags like this, is like 11 or 12-year-old, breed with all the hinds in the valley and they shoot the two-year-old double six that's never had a chance to breed. And they wonder why the genetics crash through the floor. Basic stuff. And what we wanted to do was produce an endless supply of free-range, pure Queensland genetic deer. Uh, that's the first one ever taken on the Ridge Group ballot. There's been probably a thousand stags now taken. Not just one year, but everywhere, every year. Who's that guy? <laughs> Remember that day well, Dick. Okay, so some of our ballot results. Um, 2008 to 2014, 350 basically thousand dollars generated out of the Ridge Group ballot that goes back into landowners into the local area. If we put that magnifier uh, factor on it, what's that worth? What, what's it been worth now over 24 years of ballot? What's it worth then if that's what we're generating on the ballot side? What's the potential for a herd like the Queensland Red Deer if everybody got behind it? We're talking tens of millions of dollars a year back through landowners' hands and a valued resource. Um, we set up a project called Glenfiddich. It's an example of a viable, sustainable use management project on a Queensland private property. Okay, and it's based on shooting females for meat, keeping the hind population down. It's one of the blocks we use for uh, the ballot and hunting as well. But we realise a lot of people just want to come up with their family, stay somewhere safe and shoot a deer for meat, and that's what we've, we've accommodated. And it's growing and growing. We're, we're having trouble actually holding on to it now because the project's working. For 20 odd years, the landowner's been behind us and he hasn't poisoned one tree on that property. He's so much be behind this property that he never torn a tree. All other landowners are laughing at him. We have anti-coiners, fussy gals, plenty gals, narsutas, Dunarts, everything. They come into our hut. People have been to our hut there and realise that at night these things are because the trees have been let to, left to generate again. It's gone back towards the wild and it's all because wild deer have been the catalyst to replace the income from, wild, from cattle. It's been based on personal use venison. But we've had to be compliant with food safety legislation. And a lot of people don't realise, say about giving venison to other people, what a great idea. It's illegal in Queensland to give, gift, sell, supply, distribute or allow to be distributed venison. You give, you shoot a deer with a mate and give him half, it's illegal. Crazy stuff. I was trying to explain why. On our Glenfiddich, we've taken a lot of animals where we've gone right through it. We've got all the measurements, we've weighed everything right down to the individual cuts, the live weight, dress weights hot carcass weights, you name it. This one here, 36 kilos yield of venison off this, uh, off this animal would have been a cull stag. We averaged it probably about $15 a kilo. Gave us $532.70 worth of meat in that hunter's hands for 100 bucks. That's what we charge them for a cull stag. Right, so we say to people, you've got to pay for it, but we're making it so that it's not, not bad. That money goes back into the landowners. What we found, and this is all in the, uh, the paper I wrote for the, sustainable, the last Sustainable Use Conference and finally got it peer reviewed and everything, more red marks on it than <laughs> I should have done grade four again. Um, $499 per cattle breeder area that we were replacing. So if we're saying that you've got 100 more deer and that's going to drop 10 cows off your herd, 
that's going to be worth $5,000 to that landowner to replace cattle with deer. And that's, again, this is citizen science. We're trying to get it in there. It's based on quality deer management principles. Brian Murphy has been my biggest sounding board. Um, fantastic guy. I'm always throwing stuff over to him. Brian, can I say this? He said, no, you can't say that. <laughs> Shakes his head and we work it out what we can do. It's an overall management system based on controlling population densities, increasing herd quality and health, utilising recreational hunters in conjunction with trapping or culling if you need to. All right? So it's bringing the deer back from a situation as regarded as pest to one of a managed game animal on, on landowner's properties. Improving herd quality increases hunter participation, as we've talked about other talks, uh, um, people have talked about today, that if you, your herd of deer is seen as low quality, you get low participation. It's like fishing. You go, oh, I only get mongrel fish in that area. Nobody wants to go there. They think there's good stuff there, or if there is good stuff there, you get participation. When people are participating and there's a few dollars turning over, it then increases landowner support, and then that increases habitat, and the whole lot starts to go around the circle. Um, so there's no overall plan, but it's critical that any plan we put forward be accepted by all participants, the landowners, the government and the hunters. So what we've aimed at doing over the last 24 years is set up a plan which we call Hunt Easy, right? because we want a system that can work in Queensland. Now Hunt Easy, in Queensland now, I'll go through a bit more of it soon, we're basically required to have pest management plans, PMPs. There's no recognition of property-based management plans. What we're trying to suggest to people is you've got a property-based management plan, it'll cover OH&S, fire, vegetation, NLIS, chemical, wildlife management, um, all under that overall plan. Vegetation, you can have your trees where everything's, you know, as you know, under the Vegetation Act, all coloured. You can't chop this, you can't bulldoze there, you can't do that. You've got to do something with your pest weeds, so your plan goes out under that. Wildlife management, split into two areas, introduced and native. The native, say something like kangaroos, you might have a full protection in the area, or you might have numbers up high enough that you can apply to national parks and wildlife and get permits to harvest. Some people see them as pests, the worst pests in the country, the kangaroos. Other people see them as something to be cherished, right from one side to the other. Introduced, if you regard them as a pest, right out, you can just then put them in the same category as dingo, pigs, rabbits, which you might say total eradication. If you don't regard them as a pest, they come under a quality deer management plan, which allows you to trap them for farming, cull them, for human consumption or pet meat, or go for recreational hunting for trophy and venison, and underneath that is your management plans. So it allows the landowner then to say, I'm going to manage my animals on my property like this, and what we're trying to get uh, to happen is that the government recognises property-based management plans. Not my idea, Brian Murphy. What does it mean for us? Okay. Queensland, 2009, Rusa deer classed as pest level two. Red deer, pest level three, which is supposed to be the lowest level. Fallow, pest level three. Chittle, pest level two. You've only got to have one complaint by your local your neighbour to the pest controller in the area that says your deer are causing a problem and your pest level three, low level, you know, not a problem deer, are suddenly pest level two. Tick of a pen. It doesn't mean anything. It just means they're under the under the, um, the axe. Vast areas of Queensland has been taught, and all this is high timber country here, you'll see all the dead trees, poison, covered in land tanner, there's erosion, you see the marks around the side of the hill where cattle have walked it down for 100 years, but all of a sudden these deer are doing the ter terrible ecological damage on this country. It's this beat up we were talking about before, this false information that's going around. Or, uh, MP McVeigh said, 
<clears throat> under the Feral Deer Act, you can't sell a deer, you can't trade in it. What they wanted to do was stop anybody from trading in a deer, making a dollar out of it in any way possible, want us all to treat them as a pest, and then they can slowly get rid of them. And they said you can't give, gift, sell, supply, whatever, on any of them. Well, we looked into it. Finally, I got this in, in writing from them, that while we can't trade in a pest, we can tra trade in their products. So a landowner can sell the skins, antlers, or the hunt. Um, the opportunity to hunt. So there is a way for a landowner to say, those animals on my property that are running there are worth $500 each to me if I harvest them. So we've set up a system of a right to harvest system. Right? So a landowner can come along, it can be to an individual, it can be to a group, and say, I will sell you the right to harvest those animals. Right? There's a lot more to it, the insurance and the whole lot. We've had to look into it closely. We saw the biosecurity, because we don't trust them at all. I've seen a lot of the inter-office memos, because we've got a lot of people actually helping us from inside departments. And they say, have a look at this, and go, whoa. Is that what you really think about us? Is that what you really want? They want a widespread awareness campaign discrediting deer and other animals. They wanted everybody to, to regard them as a pest. And unfortunately, hunters, landowners have taken this pest mantra. They've grabbed the ball and they've run with it. Oh, this is a good name, all these terrible pests. And they're going to then use that to drive us into the ground. What they want is a system whereby landowners can be directed to control any pest species on their land at the discretion of biosecurity. We're already seeing it with fire ants and pest weeds. Uh, you'd see it with your rabbit boards and that down here where a landowner can say, no, I'm not going to control my rabbits. Somebody can come on, do it, and send you the bill. This is how it works under the Biosecurity Act in Queensland, 77 and 78, under the local government's pest management plan. Somebody's got a problem, they say you've got too many pests on your property. Pest control notice is issued uh, and the landowner's got the ability then, he, he can say, okay, I'll just kill them, kill them all. If he doesn't, he or she doesn't, they've got a compliance period. If they don't comply, they can be sent a non-compliance notice. There's penalties up to $80,000 for pest level one, which is Samba or hog deer. You know? They don't exist in Queensland, but there's some big, yeah. Some stupid people have taken those species and let them go on Queensland as well. So very soon, we'll, when they are found, there will be pest level one activity start. So basically, what happens is if you don't comply, they can put in officers to come in and get rid of those animals on your property and you can say, nope, you're not coming on my property and that's good. They will sit out at your front gate and charge you a couple of thousand dollars a day and that then goes on to your, basically your rates notice and if you don't pay it, it's then accrues interest at under what five or seven percent or whatever until you sell your property, and then they get their money first. It's all written into the Biosecurity Act. If anybody wants to check, I saw it firsthand up in the Chittle Country. Landowners with leases, leases that have been in their family for a hundred years, and they've come up, and they said, "Well, before you get your leases reinstated, you've got to control your chonky apple and your parthenium and your wild deer." We saw over 30,000 chittle deer slaughtered up there and left to lie. It was an unbelievable massacre. Right? And a lot of people say, oh, look, you can't harm the deer because you can't shoot them well out of choppers and whatever. Holy dooly, you try shooting chittle out of choppers in that open country up there. It's like stealing corn from blind chickens. It's just, yeah, it's terrible. Right up. Rat sale grass, parthenium, I'll flick through that. OK, it's an offence to kill an animal in Queensland under the Animal Care and Protection Act 2001. <coughs> Literally, you, it's an offence to kill an animal, but if you've killed that animal and you're working under an act, you've got offence exemptions in place. Right? So it means we don't have any game legislation in Queensland. We never have for wild deer, only for ducks and quail years ago. So it means all we've got is the Biosecurity Act. So there's really no such thing as recreational hunting in Queensland anymore. So, I won't talk too much more. LPA is like your LLS down here. Basically, this is the thing we haven't talked about here today, the JBAS, Yoni's Disease Biosecurity Score. What they're aiming at is a score. So every landowner's basically got a score on your property of how good you're managing your country. 
if you've got a low score and you go and you've got a high score, you go to the sale yard with your cattle, you sell first for the highest dollars. If you want to buy his cattle, you're going to pay less because you've got to then quarantine those cattle until they're clear and give them blood tests. So it's going to force landowners through the hip pocket to comply. It's all there on the website. State forest hunting, if I can just take another minute on Doug. State forest hunting has been a big thing and I've copped a lot of flack on media recently on, the, on, the, um, on Facebook and whatever because people think I'm against state forest hunting. I'm not. But I'm, ex I'm against failing at an attempt to put in place state forest hunting in Queensland. The worst thing we can do is have one shot and miss and that's what we could do. Unfortunately, we've got a unicameral system of government. We've got one house in Queensland. At the moment it's made up of 48 ALP, 39 LNP, then three CATA, one nation green independent. We go the wrong way at this, and even if this was to change at the next election in October, after October 2020, and we saw 10 one nation in there, whatever, we probably will see LNP and Labor vote together to put down any legislation that comes up. That's the truth of the matter. To try and change that, I asked Robert Borzak, and I was going to put it right on him, I asked Robert a few years ago, I said, Robert, how do we get a game council in Queensland? He said, give me, his words were, give me $10 million in 10 years and I'll have a go at it. Right? That's why we've put in place a ridge alternative. What we've tried to do is look at all the acts, everything, We've got the recommendations in place and what we're saying, quite simply, is to say, let, get the government to accept property-based management plans. So landowners that want to protect deer as a game animal on their properties can do so. If they then want to access their state lease country, they can under that as well. Then we've got a model in place that can be then extended to non-tenured state forest land and then after that possibly into national park areas. But it gives us a foot in the door. Very soon, all right, another 12 months, we'll have a state election in Queensland. Deb Frecklington, our local member, has pledged that she will get behind us. She's a lovely lady, I've known her for years. My cousin Tony Perrett could be the new primary industries minister. He is the keenest deer hunter around. Loves QDM, loves the whole lot. Was Ridge treasurer for four years, five years. We've got them there. If we could put something to them that fits a Queensland situation to get their votes, most of their votes from Liberal and the, and the other uh, crossbenchers, we've got a chance. If we pass him a ball or a hot potato that's too hot to handle, his party will block him and we've lost our chance. So, I say is sustainable use possible under Queensland conditions? Yes, but it needs recognition of the historic herds, acceptance of sustainable use management. Um, yeah, the future is as big as our imagination and as strong as our self-control. The only support we've got so far is from the Shoes and Fishers Party in Queensland. And they are struggling because they've got no dollars. They can't get going. They can't get unity. And half their members now are saying, we want to get into state forests and kill all these nasty feral pests. So if I can just ask people here, who would love to see all the nasty feral pests in, in Australia eradicated? Can you put your hands up? Great. <laughs> which, which nasty pests are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're all in favour of sustainable management of our resources. I'm not saying have cats and foxes run around everywhere, but I'm saying the species have got a value that we can manage, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. I used up my question time. Uh, we're running really late, so if you mind ask Clark a question, I'd suggest you do it at dinner time, or maybe the next time we have one, or you could send me an email, and I could get it to Clark and send it out yeah. to everybody. So. Well, tell them to go on my Australian World Country thing yes. and send me a send me a, a note, ask a question, yep. and fire stuff back to you. Yep.